You know, there's nothing like cracking that, that cellophane and pulling that record out. It just smells great. Welcome to Buzz Mayhem Hour. Non-stop hardcore energy. I love the show, guys. You're awesome. Unlike any other. With your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. The Bodfather. Man, this stuff rocks. This is Mike Spritzer from Devil Driver, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. The views and opinions of the guests do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of Bod's Mayhem Hour, its staff, affiliates, or sponsors. Parental discretion is advised. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Bod's Mayhem Hour. I am your host, John the Bod, a.k.a. the Bod Father. And as always, I bring you guys and gals awesome interviews today. It's a huge honor and a privilege to welcome guitarist Mike Spritzer of Devil Driver. And Devil Driver will release their 10th studio album entitled Dealing with Demons Volume 2 via Napalm Records on May 12th. And they have a single out entitled Through the Debts. You want to get out and check that out. So, Mike, welcome back to the podcast. How you doing, my friend? And uh, how excited are you about this new album coming out? Very excited. We've been finished since. 2019 i finished all my parts in 2018 it uh feels like a long time ago that we finished this thing how difficult though is it to set on this and finally now it's out and and done and you can move on how difficult was it to set on this not that difficult i was happy that we got to be able to release the first volume it was kind of a blessing in disguise because you know we had never done a double record before i don't think we ever will ever again Mm -hmm. But because of the pandemic, it got us something to release, you know, when everything was on lockdown. And luckily, we were able to have a second half for when we were able to go out, actually go out on tour and support it. So sitting on it was pretty easy because I wanted, we all wanted, you know, to wait for things to settle down and so we can get back out on tour and then go promote the record properly. How excited are you to see Devil Driver entering its third decade, man? To see where this band is, you know, to start out, to go through its demons, and now you're in your third decade of Devil Driver. How does that feel for the band wholeheartedly? It's a little unreal. You know, uh, it's pretty unusual for someone to be in a band as long as I have. You know, Des has been doing it for since 02. I've been doing it since 04. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it was my 19th year this month. From when I first went out on tour with the guys, it's uh, pretty amazing. And uh, there's more to come after this record. I'm actually, right before I started this interview, I was working on a new song. Oh, wow. See, they never stop, guys. <laughs> That's the point of you never stop. <laughs> Try not to. <laughs> so I want to talk about this a little bit. Now, we know this is a double CD, double album. Why release it separately and not traditionally just as a double album? Is it just something to say, okay, we've got something to release later on. Let's let everybody, you know, uh, get their chops on this one, and then we'll release the other one later on. Well, I think 20 songs, or actually 19. There's one song that I think we're going to be releasing later that's not on volume two. But I think it, people's attention spans are a little too short these days to, to yeah. handle 19 songs all at once. And I mean, even for someone like me who um, does music for a living, I would, 20 songs would be a bit much, but we wanted to release it them um, six months apart or maybe a year apart. We hadn't really decided, but we sure as hell didn't want to wait four years in between or three years in between releases. So are you one of those guys who are now like, like have straight away from the full length? You just want that EP since everything is how it is. No. Like oh, okay. okay. No, I don't ever feel like doing EPs. I like doing full records. Mm. Not to say I wouldn't do an EP, but I don't, <laughs> I just don't see Devil Driver ever doing that. You know, if we're going to get into the studio and we're going to spend all the time, you know, as far as setting things up, getting into the vibe of things, you know, sometimes your best material isn't songs one through five. It's songs six through 12. You know, oh, yeah. There's kind of a, there's a rhythm that you get into. And uh, 
for me, I would imagine the first couple songs that I work on on a record never see the light of day. Did you think, Mike, the band would have 10 albums at this point in the Devil Driver Music Library, or should there have been more possibly? I think 10 is enough for how long we've been together. You know, we've almost consistently, you know, given everybody a record every two years or so. And I don't think I would have been able to crank out more material in that amount of time. It seems even when uh, Devil Driver was on hiatus and Des went to go do Cold Chamber, you know, I was still working on Trust No One or, you know, the country's record. It's just nonstop. What's been the most heated discussion the band has had about a song being worked on for an album or maybe just an album name in the studio possibly? I know there's got to be some to where it's like you want to strangle each other. <laughs> if uh, the biggest argument the band has ever had about a song, I would like as far as, you know, there's been arguments <laughs> from between uh, individual, you know, maybe two members or three members, but as a whole band, it was the end of the Axial Fall on uh, Last Kind Words on um, that Hammond that's in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of debate of whether or not we should have put that in there, and it um, wasn't the prettiest conversation, but a decision <clears throat> eventually was made. But looking back on it now, are you glad that you've done it, you guys? The having the hammock on it, or yeah, in general, just, yeah, just in general. I, with it. oh, I wish it wasn't there, okay, but um, yeah, my vote was against it, but it doesn't bother me nearly as much as it used to. It, but still, I think uh, it was fine as, as is. So, dealing with demons volume two, is this more a heavier and harsher uh, album than dealing with demons volume one? Yes, and no, you know. Volume one, the one thing that I think that makes it overall a little bit more of a mellow record compared to volume two is just the fact that we have the song Wishing on there. And it's something I would definitely not call that a brutally heavy song, but it's just, it's one of my favorite songs on volume one. And there's no repeats. So there, there isn't like a wishing part two on volume two. It's just more of an onslaught from beginning to end. Did you see a rebirth of Dez with these two albums, if that makes sense? Because, I mean, it looks like he's poured everything out of him onto these two albums. Hard to say. I'm never around uh, when Dez does the vocals. You know, he likes to be by himself with just the producer, and I can't blame him. You know, having too many cooks in the kitchen and singing is such a personal thing. I would, you know, if, if it were me, I would, wouldn't want any, anybody around. But uh, Steve Evitz, who produced this record, has a tendency to, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a Jedi. He can play tricks with your mind to get what's done, even though uh, you don't think it, it's possible. And he did that with me over the fact that he made me learn every single song and made Neil learn every single song on rhythms because he wanted me on one side he wanted Neil on the other. He didn't want the same guitar player playing both the rhythms. Mm -hmm. And you know, to do that with tw 20 songs shortly after, you know, just because I, I write the song doesn't mean I can actually play it quite yet, you know, because their demos can be pretty sloppy sometimes. Mm -hmm. But he did, and I would imagine that he went through the same process with Dez when they were in the studio. And... Um, he just he's very he's very encouraging in a very positive way and will uh make you want to do better he did with this, me so i imagine he did with des as well now this is the second album that he's working with you guys on um do you see you guys working on him again down the road because it seems like he gets something out of you guys that maybe somebody else might not get maybe i hope so he i love absolutely love working with steve and i can't see why we wouldn't be doing the next record with him what led the track through the depths to be the first song released off this album? What was it about that one for you guys that said that that's got to go out? You know what? Uh, I have nothing to do with that. I've always felt that I've spent so much time with the songs up until that point. Mm -hmm. I have ones that are 
you know, I write, wrote more of. There's songs on here that Neil wrote more of. And I'm too close to him to make that kind of call. I actually prefer, you know, someone like an outside listener to listen to the whole record and find out what sticks out with them and actually have a few people do it. And just in the long run, go with what your sources uh, are telling you. Because for up to me, I would release my favorite song, but that's not necessarily going to be the best song for the public to hear. Uh, for the record was there a track that you guys were working on that totally ended up sounding different than what it was intended to for the album kind of hard to say because it's been so long i honestly can't remember but we did take more songs than usual and uh put them on a seven string guitar and just tune down to drop a from drop c uh bloodbath which you guys haven't heard yet which is one of the is uh one of the songs that I wrote in Drop A, I think that one was always on there. But there, there was a song or two or three songs on volume one or two, I can't remember, that uh, we switched the tunings at the last minute. And that can change the vibe of the song quite a bit. But for the most part, a lot of what changed in pre-production were the drum parts. Steve really worked Austin on, on this one, probably a little bit harder than Austin would have liked, but... We spent two weeks, just me, Steve, and Neil, and Austin in a studio, uh, just playing the songs over and over again. And 90, 80 to 90% of the changes were to the drums. I know these are your babies. I get that. But are there any tracks standing out more to you than any right now on this album, possibly? Hard to say. Hard to say. Um, let's see. It's been so long. I just because the record is coming out soon doesn't necessarily mean I have been listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's this actually, you know, there's a song called uh, "Summoning" that uh, I would say "Summoning" and "Nothing Lasts Forever" are two that really stick out to me. Um, Summoning has this part where Austin is doing slams with his kick drums. And uh, when he started doing that, it was one of the moments in the studio. I was like, well, what are you doing? Are you doing slams with your with your feet? And he's, he just looks at me with his Austin look. Yeah, isn't that cool? You know, and, uh, you know, that was one of the cooler moments in the studio. It was something as silly as that, just the fact that he was doing slams on his feet. I just had never really heard anyone do it like he's he's doing it on uh on summoning so listen out for that <laughs> was the track listing placement important for this album i know you've got 20 songs 19 20 songs but i mean was the track listing placement important for these two albums yes i think it's always important i did not have anything to do with that either okay. and i'll the the uh the order of volume two has probably changed four or five times since we finished the record. Even like the order that I have in my phone right now is different than what you guys have. And mm -hmm. I, I need to go through and relist it. So I know where, where things go, but uh, I think the label changed some things up at the last minute and the, uh, the news never made it to me. Oh no. You didn't get that email folks. You, what, what happened? I did not get that memo. <laughs> Look, I know songs don't make albums for certain reasons, but are there any songs that was left off that should have been on this album, in your opinion, possibly? No, there were <laughs> there were a lot more songs. Neil had way more than I did, and there were one or two that we had started to work on because, you know, we had a solid 20 songs, or I'd say a solid 17 songs. And then there were probably like between four to six that we couldn't figure out which ones were going to make it or not. And yeah, there was a couple that I wrote that didn't make it. And one of them just straight up sounded too much like another song that I had written. And it was, that that made it an easy decision. Like, eh, this song just sounds too much like that one. Let's just get rid of it. And yeah. So we, so we did. So what's the growth musically, though, you've seen from yourselves working on these two albums compared to others? I mean, I know that each album you grow musically, but 
what's impressed you the most from everybody that you've seen grow on this album? I've definitely grown into a way where I write solos a lot differently than I used to. And I'm always a, I've never been a big fan of doing, making guitar parts that are very dissonant. And all of a sudden I'm all about dissonance. You know, John Berkland tried to pound this into me for years and years and years. And I was very reluctant to that style. And I think it's probably just comes from just learning too much Metallica when I was a kid and just playing, you know, almost power chords through every song. Yeah. And, you know, John Berkland really kind of opened my eyes to a completely different approach to writing uh, music on a guitar, you know, and from more of a drummer's perspective and making things sound dirty and, you know, not so clean. And um, unfortunately, I got really into it when he quit the band. Mm. And for some reason, now I'm all about it. I love using dissonance. I like putting these weird major minor seconds together in solos and making it sound like shit and then have it resolve. But um, that as far as me personally, that's how I've grown. As far as the band during that time, you know, we had some different members in the band back then, obviously, but uh, this is the first time that we sat down with a, a producer, got into a room for two weeks and did pre-production you know usually we just go straight from my studio you know from recording it here into the studio with a, another producer and just kind of you know do drums do guitars make little changes here and there but we always kind of skip that pre-production phase and we we did we did it on this one for the first time ever and it proved to be very helpful all right, so what's been the most memorable show that Devil Driver has been a part of that you still can't believe that this band was? Is there is there is there one show, I man, just something that the band's been part of that you're like, I can't believe we're doing this or I can't believe we're a part of this? The one that sticks out is the first time we played Moscow. Oh, wow. Okay. It, I mean, the story about what happened before getting there being on no sleep whatsoever and you know they are absolutely chaotic the most chaotic crowd i've ever seen in my life and um regardless of how shitty the trip was to get to that show and how horrible we felt how tired we were hung over whatever when that show was going on it made it all worth it. So did you guys have your like little uh, Monsters of Rock thing like previously, like that show? Because that show was crazy too. Did y'all have the military in front and everything as well or not? No, nothing like that. Okay. It was just, it's surprising how crazy they get. Just full-blown mosh pit going on, crowd surfing, people jumping up on stage. I think we had like six or seven people up on stage with us just constantly throwing people back into the crowd. Wow. Um, my guitar tech at the time just disappeared into the crowd one time when he had to bear hug somebody and the guy was too strong for him just to throw him back into the crowd so he just basically bear hugged him and just started to tip over until he got him off stage and at some point he made it back into the crowd and he didn't get hurt but it's just nuts you know uh, the Ukraine Russia are always memorable shows and then if i had to pick one other one would be uh headlining over cannibal corpse in mm. london and uh you know i just i remember being a kid watching ace ventura and, and put you know putting that movie on pause skateboarding down to tower records and buying the bleeding immediately oh that's and awesome. uh you know i must have been 12 maybe 13 years old at the time and you know cannibal corpse goes on to be one of the biggest death metal bands in history and uh we're playing after them in london that was that was a little bit surreal and now george is doing his uh what was it project something um i can't think about this project he's doing um i can't think of it either i haven't heard it yet it's pretty cool 
<laughs> it's actually pretty cool. But think about this, though, man. You guys go over to Moscow and places like that. These kids and adults, I mean, these adults as well, they're going to do something that they hardly ever get to do. They get to, you know, release everything and just have fun, you know, and just listen to some music and have a live show and just let go of everything. That's huge, you know, because a lot of them don't get that until they get to go to nope. a show. I never thought I would go to Russia. I mean, I've been to a lot of places I thought I would never go. South Africa being another mm-hmm. one. But, and uh, Japan. It took us a long time to get to Japan. I'd say so. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we just, we've only been twice, but we finally started going, you know. God, I think it took about somewhere between 10 to 13 years to get there after we became a band. Do you see the crowds over there? I know you mentioned this a little bit, but do you see the crowds over there even more crazier than American uh, crowds? Or no? Yes and no. It depends on where you're playing in America. Okay. Gotcha. Um, you know, I could, you could give me the name of almost any city and I can give you a, <laughs> tell you how crazy the crowd will be on a scale of one to 10 pretty easily. <laughs> but uh, they're great, you know? It's a, it's a di- totally different culture over there. And a lot of things about it I really like. You know, everyone's extremely clean and polite and, you know, you could have this massive metal show going on and everyone will leave and there won't be one single bit of trash on the floor. No, oh, that's, that's just, crazy. Just spotless. Well, and over here, it's like trash city. Yep. <laughs> it's truth, folks. It's truth. Yeah. Pick up after you, you messy motherfuckers. <laughs> All right, now we're going to throw Devil Driver out the window here for just a little bit. Okay. So if if you could be a member of an iconic band and play one of their legendary shows, you, you can be a member of that band. Just, you know, if you want to be Kirk Hammett and Metallica, that's fine. That's what I'm throwing out here. Which band would it be and what show possibly would you want to play? Dude, I wouldn't want to be Zimzum and Marilyn Manson on any of the shows on the Antichrist Superstar Tour. Okay, that's the first one on here. That uh, that would be pretty cool to see that. That's awesome. Wow. I mean, I got to. I, I that was the second concert I went to. You know, I got to see Nirvana when I was like ten. Really? Wait. No, I was twelve years old. I think. I think that was in '93. And then my second show was in Santa Monica, California, at a venue that I've never been to since. But it was uh, to go see Marilyn Manson. Um, shortly after he released Antichrist Superstar. And, dude, that show was fucking cool. Oh, wow. And, I, you know, that's back in the days when he was just on fire. Oh, that was, yeah, that was probably the time where nobody wanted to touch him. Like, the protesters was out and everything, and just, oh, my God. Yeah, to me, there's, uh, Manson in that era, there was, there, there was no better front man at the time. And I, I still don't think anyone could beat him. I mean, it, what he was doing was just, incredible oh yeah he 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 played the part perfectly i mean he you know he did it to a t and i'm just glad you got to see nirvana i would have loved to got to see nirvana <laughs> before kirk passed away you know i mean i still like nirvana i still like their music me too i like them a lot better than Foo fighters <laughs> all right folks devil driver will release their 10th studio album entitled dealing with demons volume 2 via napalm records on may 12th get out and check that out so mike my friend how can folks stay in touch with devil driver buy this new album everything under the name of devil driver how can they do that sir well you can always find our news on our website obviously and follow us, you know we all have social media accounts on instagram and facebook so uh Come find me. We're always posting updates. And uh, I would imagine uh, a lot of people out there visit the, the metal forums from time to time. And But Devil Driver on Instagram and Devil Driver on Facebook. My, my name on Instagram is Michael Spritzer. And uh, we've always got news up there. And also, I'll have all these links posted in the description of this interview when it goes out, so that way nobody can say, I don't know where to go get it. It's in the description if you just look. Just hit show more. That's all you got to do on the YouTube page. Mike, before I let you go, would you care to do a promo for my show? Sure. This is Mike Spritzer from Devil Driver, and you're listening to Bod's Mayhem Hour. 
everybody stick around. We got some great, great stuff coming up. And you only, only hear these interviews right here on Bod's Mayhem Hour. Please get out and check out our Facebook page. It has our podcast link and our YouTube link. And you definitely want to subscribe to that YouTube link if you like what I'm doing. And I hope, truly, truly hope you guys do. Also, Devil Driver, 10th studio album entitled Dealing with Demons, Volume 2, via Napalm Records, out on May 12th. Check them out. If you haven't, check Devil Driver out. Get out from under your rock. Go listen to their stuff. Because I guarantee you will not be disappointed. I really like this band. They bring a fresh breath of air to the music world for heavy metal. And I like what they're doing. And I'm not saying it's because Mike's on here. I like Des and what he stands for and what all he's done and his vocals and things like that. I think this band is a truly, truly breath of fresh air, honestly. So, Mike, thank you guys so much for what you guys are still continuing to do. You're welcome. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.